can have a seat. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. (laughs) He will make your paths straight, it says in Proverbs. Like the plan is good. God is good. We were just singing about that. We were thinking about that, reflecting on that. God's, I think God's plan is good. God makes some amazing promises for us. And I want to dig into that as we are here in week two of our series called Real Life. Uh, what's the real plan of God? What's the real desire of God for us? And so as we're uh, digging into that this morning, let's pray together. God, I thank you that you are good. I thank you for the the times and the ways that we're able to call that to mind. For the thoughts and the memories and the experiences we have that display your goodness. God, we think of those now in our hearts and in our minds. And we give you thanks. Thanks. God, I also know that life's not always good. It doesn't always feel good. It doesn't always look good. Real life is messy. It can be inconsistent, confusing, disheartening, discouraging. And there are some of us this morning who are, who are there in those spots. And so, God, I pray that no matter where we find ourselves on the spectrum of life, whether we're experiencing life right now as supremely good, or whether we're experiencing life as supremely devastating, I pray that you would speak to us and that your power and presence would be made real to us, be made known to us, that we would experience your love and grace and mercy. So God, give us joy and peace. Speak to us now a word that we need to hear. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, do you ever have times when things don't go according to your plan? Anybody? Anybody ever? Or I actually, yeah, actually the question for me in my life would be, do you ever have times when things go according to your plan? Right, that would be the more realistic question for me to ask. April 2nd, 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, we woke our boys up and uh, surprised them and we said, hey, we're going to the airport. We're we're going on a spring break trip. They had no idea what we were going to do. And so we we got to the airport. We were up from 3 a.m. here. We we flew to... uh, we flew to Las Vegas. Don't worry, we didn't stay there. We didn't take the boys gambling. I'm sure they would have won something, but, uh, but we didn't do that. But we flew to Las Vegas. We met some uh, college friends for lunch, and then we drove to Springdale, Utah, where Zion National Park sits. And we, we probably got to Zion at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and so uh, an hour behind Central Time. So we'd been up for a while. Um, the crank factor was starting to, uh, to, to be a real factor in our life, but we, we sat there after a long drive uh, in Zion National Park, and it was absolutely beautiful. It was the night of the national championship basketball game, and I really wanted to see it, and our 10-year-old especially really wanted to watch the game, and so uh, we'd driven by our hotel. It was right by the entrance to the, the park. Um, there was a restaurant like a sports grill right next to the entrance of the park. And I thought, it'll be perfect. We'll leave here. We'll go there. We'll watch the game. It'll be fantastic. So we pulled up to the sports grill. I walked in to just check it out. And there's like one TV on the wall and it's playing golf and there are people watching it. And so I thought, okay, this is not the place for us. No big deal. We've still got time. I'd looked up and there was another sports grill just about a mile down the road in Springdale. And it said they had a lot of TVs and I thought that will be perfect. Well, for some reason there was traffic, lots and lots and lots of traffic. And so we sat for 30 minutes, 45 minutes in traffic and went about a quarter of a mile. So finally, after maybe an hour, 
uh, we made it to our hotel parking lot and we said, hey, let's park at our hotel. We'll walk down, we'll find a place to eat, no big deal. So we parked in our hotel parking lot, we got out of the car, we started to walk. It was a longer walk than we remembered uh, from looking at the map. We checked out uh, the first restaurant and they said, it'll be an hour and a half wait. I had three tired, cranky boys with me. I said, thank you. We'll you know, put our name on the list, but we walked somewhere else, same thing, hour and a half wait. We walked into a third restaurant, and uh, there weren't many people in line, but we stood in the lobby in the restaurant for 15 minutes, and nobody ever came over to say hello to us. Finally, at that point, I said, let's go back to the hotel. We're close to the hotel. We'll walk to the hotel. We'll check into the hotel. We'll eat peanut butter and jelly. We'll watch the game on our TV in the hotel room. That seemed like a good plan. We walked back to the hotel. We walked into the lobby, all five of us walked into the lobby. Amanda stepped up to the desk and she said, we're here to check in for Garner. And the person behind the desk said, you know, gave kind of the face back, Garner, I don't, you know. She was like, Amanda Garner. The sideways look at the screen. I'm sorry, we don't have an Amanda Garner here for tonight at this hotel. Amanda steps back for a minute. She looks in her notebook, which was so detailed for a whole trip, and she said, that's because we're not staying at this hotel. (laughs) We're staying at a hotel by the same name in Leverkin, which is 25 minutes down the road. And so uh, we were like, that's fine. We got back in the car. I thought, we're going to go to this sports grill on the way. We're going to watch the game. We got back in, more traffic, 30 minutes to get to the sports grill. By this time, it's halftime. I walk in, and all the tables are packed, and all the people are wearing jerseys, and none of them are going anywhere. I said, that's fine. Let's get back in the car. We'll go to Leverkin. We'll find fast food. We'll check in. It'll be quick. By the time we, uh, by the time we get there, we'll be able to watch the game. So we, we did that. We drove 25 minutes to Leverkin by our hotel only to find out there are no restaurants in Leverkin, Utah. So we needed to drive to the next town over. We said, fine, we'll drive to the next town over. Things are just like going according to plan so well here so far. So fine, we'll drive to the next town over. We'll go to the first place. Everybody, who wants Taco Bell? Everybody likes Taco Bell. Everybody loves Taco Bell in our family. Let's go to the Taco Bell. So we drive to the Taco Bell in Hurricane, Utah, another 20 minutes. We drive into the drive-thru. I get up to the window. I'm excited because we're going to make the end of the game. I said, hi, we'd like to order some food. And the voice on the other end said, I'm so sorry. It's going to be 40 minutes before we can make you any food. And I said, I'm sorry. It's a little fuzzy out here on the speaker. What I thought I heard was that you said, it's going to be 40 minutes before you can make our tacos. Is that correct? At a fast food Taco Bell restaurant, she said, I'm so sorry, there's only a couple of us in here, and yes, it will be about 40 minutes. And I said, great, we're going to Wendy's. And so we, uh, we drove down to Wendy's, a couple people had fallen asleep by that point, we got our food, we drove back to the hotel, pulled in just in time to hear the end of the game on the radio. Things did not go according to plan in any way, shape, or form, and the more I live, the longer I live, (laughs) the more I realize that things in life don't go according to plan. Things almost never in my life, at least, seem to go according to plan. And I've noticed, and I'm, I'm asked this a lot as a pastor, that a major question that people struggle with all throughout life is what's the plan? People wanna know what the plan is. People of faith want to know what's the plan of God. People of faith want to know what's the plan of God for my life. I'm at a crossroads. What's the plan of God for my life? I'm at a decision point. What's the plan of God? I need to make a decision about a job. I'm thinking about marriage. Like, what's the plan of God? And so here's what I'm going to do this morning. We've been reading this book with our boys uh, the, the past night or so called The Giver. I don't know if any of you have read that book, but in The Giver, uh, it's like this kind of utopian society. We're still learning about it. But when you're 12 years old, everybody's called up onto a stage in front of the whole community. And one at a time, they tell everybody what the plan is for the rest of their life. And so I'm going to start with this section over here. And I'll just call you up one at a time. And I'd like to now give you God's plan for the rest of your life. Brian, go ahead and come on up. No, that was a joke. I'm, I'm just... 
I'm just, wouldn't it be like, that would be great. You'd be like, oh my gosh, church was amazing this morning. Everybody got their plan. It was fantastic. There are different methods that people use and people have used throughout history to try to find God's plan for their life. One of my favorites is the, uh, is like the, the flipping point. Like, God, I have this question. I'm going to get my Bible. I'm going to flip. I'm going to point. And then you're going to tell me something. I, I, I'm telling you that what I'm about to tell you is, is absolutely true. What happened to me this morning, I was like, let me try it. I'm just curious what would happen. So I'm going to ask a question like somebody might be asking and see what it turns to. And so uh, here's what I asked. I was just trying to pretend like I was in somebody's shoes. And I was like, God, should I... Should I get married and have a family? What would it be like for me to get married and have a family? And literally I turned and pointed to Ezra chapter 10, verse one. Here's what it says. While Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. And then they said, we have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the people around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for us. Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all the women and the children. <laughs> as honest to God where I, like, I flipped and pointed to that in asking that. So like, that's, don't do that. That's a bad, that is a bad move. Amanda's in here and I like, I, I want us, we're, we're together, we're in this together, we're not listening to Ezra chapter 10. So there's all these ways that people go about trying to, to find and discern and hear the will of God, the plan of God. And, and again, I want to look at Proverbs chapter 3 because I had a moment about 10 years ago where something with that just, just clicked for me. And it's really changed a lot of how I approach life and, and how I approach looking for the plan of God in my own life. And, and in Proverbs chapter 3, I hold fast to this promise that Susie read a minute ago where it simply says, he will make your paths straight. Like God will make your paths straight. And what I think is true is that no one wants us to discover God's will for our lives more than God. No one wants us to know God's plan more than God. God isn't trying to send us on a scavenger hunt to try to find God's plan for our life. I think God wants us to find God's plan. And so I want to talk about that. Talk about the will of God. There's a few different ways that, that you read about the will of God in Scripture. Some different categories that might help us understand what's God's will, what's God's plan for us, what's the real plan for our lives. The first way that the Bible often talks about the will of God, some people call it the sovereign will of God. The sovereign will. So there are, there are things that God is going to do no matter what because that's who God is. There's, there are things that God is, is simply going to make happen, that God desires to make happen, that God is working to make happen. There's this idea, there's this notion throughout the Bible that, that all of creation is moving in a direction. And there are things that God is doing, and God can't be stopped. So like Proverbs 19, 21, it says this, many, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Like in the end, the love of God wins, right? Galatians 4, 5 through 6, it's talking about God's will here in sending Jesus. It says, but when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption. Like God, God was going to send Jesus to earth. It's just part of God's will, God's sovereign plan. First Timothy, I love this. Paul encourages Timothy to pray for all people. And here's what he says about this. Here's what he says about praying for all people. He says, this is good. Praying for all people is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Like God's desire is that all people would know the love of God. God wants all people to be saved and come into a knowledge of the truth. When Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, here's what he teaches them to pray. Many of you know this. He says, that, he says pray this to God. God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for joining me with that over there. Right? There are things that God is already doing in the world. There are places where God is already at work in the world. There are things that God is already going to do no matter what. And so if you're looking for God's plan in your life, if you're searching for God's will in your life, 
the best question often isn't, God, what's your plan for me? If you're looking for God's will for your life, the best starting point isn't often, God, what's your plan for me? The best question to ask first is often, God, what's your plan? Like, what's your plan? What are you doing in the world? And then how can I be involved in that? The, the second way that scripture often talks about the will of God. So there's the sovereign will, the things that God's going to do anyway. And then there's the directive will or the directional will. These are the things that God directs us or, or commands us to do or not to do. Th these are things that you don't have to pray about. Right? So take the Ten Commandments, for example. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. You don't have to pray about these things. Right? Like, God, my... Um, my neighbor's garage door is open and he is storing his big green egg in there and I want it, God. I'm coveting the big green egg um, and I would like to know your will on whether or not I should steal it right now and put it on my back porch, right? You don't have to pray about things like that or God, I would like to strangle my boss, but only just a little bit. Maybe not fully unto death, but close but I want to reserve the right to make that choice in the moment. Like you don't, you don't have to pray about things like that. There are things that are part of God's directive will for our lives, God's directional will for our lives. I mean, this stuff is all over the Bible and there's some beautiful things like Micah 6, 8. Micah 6, 8 says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to show mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What does the Lord require? To act justly, to show mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Mark 1.17, Jesus says, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Follow me. It's directive. It's directional. Learn to do what Jesus does and do it. Like, listen to what Jesus says and say it. Matthew 25, Jesus says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Matthew 22, 37, somebody asked Jesus, What's the greatest commandment? And he says, To love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you're a follower of Jesus and you're looking for God's plan, if you're looking for the real plan of God, the real will of God for your life, those are things that you don't have to stop and think about. You don't have to stop and pray about. Show mercy. Love your neighbor. Pray for your enemy. Feed people who are hungry. That's God's plan for your life. That's God's plan for the life of all of God's people. Matthew 28, it's called the Great Commission. It's some of the last instructions, the directions that Jesus gives the disciples. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. That's not God's plan and will for pastors. That's God's plan for all of God's people. Go and make disciples. Like, that's the plan for all of us. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, it means by definition you are one who makes disciples, who makes disciples, who makes disciples. And together, by doing that, we change the world. That's God's plan for us. That's God's plan for you. That's God's plan for the church. And so there's the sovereign will. There's the directive will. And then finally, there's the personal will. These are the places where our story intersect with God's story. Now, here, here's the reality. I find that we often want to short circuit and skip over the first two and just get to the third one. Like, God, I just want to know, thank you, I, I appreciate so much your sovereign will and your directional will, that's great. What I would really like to know right now is what's your personal will for me in this time and in this place? And here's what I think is true. Here's what has absolutely been true for me, right? The more that you're familiar with the sovereign will of God, and the more you follow the directional will of God, the clearer the personal will of God comes for you. Right? The more you're familiar with the sovereign will of God, the more you're familiar with the things that God is already doing, 
And the more you follow the directional will of God, the more you put those things of Jesus into practice, the clearer the personal will of God becomes for you. And let's be honest, that's not how we want it to work. Like, I want some kind of burning bush from God. I want some kind of flashing lights. I want some kind of neon arrows pointing me in a direction. I want the seas to part. I want a door to open. I want a window to close. Like, whatever metaphor you can think of to use, that's what we're often looking for when it comes to God's plan and God's will. But the truth is, if we familiarize ourselves with what God is already doing, and we begin to implement in our lives the things that Jesus has already said for us to do, everything else gets clearer and clearer. I don't know about you, I'll be super honest. The way that I want this to work usually is I want God to give me the plan so that I can weigh all of my options, right? I want God to get, like, God, give me the plan. I'm not going to follow it yet. I won't commit to that or guarantee that I'll do that. But I've been doing some thinking, and I have some really good ideas on my own. And what I'd like to do is see if your plan is as smart as my three plans over here. It may not be because I'm Travis Garner, right? Like, thank you for being God. But, like, I've really done some serious, I don't know if anybody else approaches God like that, right? It's like, God, make my path straight, and then I'll follow you. That's what I want. I want you to make the path straight and clear. I want to be able to see all of the steps, and then I'll follow you. And and Proverbs, in chapter 3, takes that logic, and it flips it on its head. Here's what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Put your whole trust in God. Lean not on your own understanding. Like, thank you very much for being so intelligent, right? But lean not on your own understanding. What would it look like for you to lean on the understanding of God? In all your ways, submit to him. In all your ways, thoughts, actions, words, priorities. In all your ways, submit to him. And then he will make your paths straight. And I want to do it the opposite way all the time. Like, God, make my path straight, and then I'll trust you, and then I'll follow you, and then I'll submit to you. But Proverbs says the exact opposite of that. And so maybe, maybe you're here this morning, and maybe you're facing some kind of specific situation. Or maybe you're facing some kind of instance. Maybe you're in a scenario where you are desperately looking for the plan of God. Like, you want to know the will of God. You want to know God's plan for your life. You want to know God's plan for this particular moment in your life. And if that's you or if that's ever you, then I just, I want to ask you to consider three questions. These are three questions that you could ask yourself. Any situation, any circumstance where you're looking for direction or will or the plan, the real plan of God. First question, like, what does God want to do in this situation? What does God already want to do in this situation? The more familiar you are with the sovereign will of God and the things that God already wants to do, the clearer what you're supposed to do becomes. What does God want to do or what is God already doing in this situation? Second question, what has God already asked me to do in this situation? What has God already asked me to do in this situation? And I would say that in most situations, there is something that God has already asked us to do. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no situation where that doesn't apply. What does it look like in that particular situation that you're facing right now where you're looking for God's will, where you're looking for God's plan? What's it look like for you to do what God's already asked you to do? And then the third question is this, now what am I going to do about it? Like it's one thing to know what God is doing. It's one thing to know what God would ask you to do. It's a different thing altogether to be willing to actually do those things in that situation and that circumstance. I heard somebody this week, and I'll kind of close with this, and we'll, we'll have our time of communion and prayer. But I heard somebody this week talking about God's plan and comparing it to a map or a compass. And he said, often we want a map 
Like we are looking for the roadmap. I want to know the entire plan. I want to know all the directions. I want to know step by step what God wants me to do in this situation. And he said, God's plan usually isn't a map. Maybe sometimes on a rare occasion you might get a map downloaded from God. But most of the time, God's plan works like a compass. And a compass simply shows you the direction that you're supposed to be going. So whatever it is that you're facing... Whatever it is that you're searching for, wherever it is that you're trying to go, what would it look like for you right now to simply head in the direction of God? What would it look like for you to head in the direction of God? (laughs) There's a lot more freedom in that. There's a lot more flexibility in that. There's a lot less fear in that. To center ourselves, not on the the exact step-by-step directions, but simply on the direction that God is pointing us. What would that look like for us? What would that look like for you?